Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we've got another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is our 98th deck and it's titled Abs Artifacts. And if you haven't seen this show before, what we're doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So, jumping right into the deck tech, this random card for the week is suggested to us by Cry Baby Must Die over on Reddit, and that card is Junk Golem. So Junk Golem is a 4-mana artifact creature golem. It's a 0-0, but it does come into play with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, and at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice Junk Golem unless you remove a plus 1 plus 1 counter from it, and you can pay 1 and discard a card from your hand to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Junk Golem. So I'm not going to lie, I went through a ton of different iterations of this deck, couldn't quite figure out what I was going to do, and then eventually, with the help of some of our patrons and some other great people over on our Discord channel, we came up with a phenomenal idea for this deck. And that is going to center around the colors that we're going to play, because Junk Golem is colorless, we can play any colors we want, and it's going to center around our commanders. So let's start with our commanders, because I did say commanders plural, and that is going to be Ichtekic Salvage Splicer and Rabo Soul Tender. So we have a pair of partners leading the way, and you may be able to tell what we're doing if you look at Junk Golem and then look at Ichtekic, because Ichtekic is four and a green for a 1-1 human artificer that says when it enters the battlefield, create a 3-3 colorless golem artifact creature token, and whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on Ichtekic and a plus one plus one counter on each golem you control. So we are a golem matters style deck, so we want to play as many golems as possible. We want to make sure that we are making our artifacts kind of hit the graveyard for Ichtekic. And so since we're hoping on our artifacts hitting the graveyard, we might as well pair Ichtekic up with Rabo Soul Tender, which is three white black for a 2-2 two, two human cleric. He's got flying, other creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, it is kind of tough with Ravos being a massive $8.50 for this deck, because since we're trying to keep everything under a $100 budget, having one of our commanders be close to $9 is not where we want to be. Unfortunately, because I wanted Ichtekic in the command zone so badly, and I wanted to have white and black in the deck, there was no way for us to do this for any cheaper, because the only other Orzov commander is Timna the Weaver, who is close to $30. So if we wanted Ichtekic in the command zone, and we wanted the Abzan colors, we had to have Ravos. We didn't really have a choice. So while it's not the perfect commander, it is nice that we get that plus one, plus one, and it still returns things from our graveyard to the battlefield. So even though he's kind of here for the colors, he still really does help out the deck quite a bit. But speaking of the deck, let's look at some of the themes for this deck. What are we actually trying to do? Well, as I mentioned already, we are a golem deck. We want to play as many golems as possible, but that also means that we want to play as many cards that make golems as possible. That's where we get cards like Blade Splicer, which is two and a white for a 1-1 human artificer. When Blade Splicer enters the battlefield, create a 3-3 colorless golem artifact creature token, and then it gives all of our golem creatures first strike. There's a ton of different splicers in the game. In fact, Ichtekic himself is a splicer that make a golem when they enter and then do something to pump up the golems or give them special abilities or different things like that. So Blade Splicer is a great example of our golem synergies because not only does she make a golem, she also protects the golems by giving them first strike. So step one for this deck is making sure that we have golems to do things with. And then our second theme is going to be centered around artifacts, specifically artifact creatures. Since golems almost entirely are artifact creatures, it makes sense to be able to do things with that. So, for example, we have Loshiel Clockwork Scholar, which is two and a white for a 2-4 legendary creature, Elephant Artificer. Prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to attacking artifact creatures you control. And, whenever one or more artifact creatures enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. So it's super nice that we can make sure that we're drawing cards with low shield. We can really only get one a turn, but that's not the end of the world. That's not terrible. 
but the real benefit to low shield is that we're preventing all combat damage that would be dealt to attacking artifact creatures we control. All of our golems can attack and never worry about dying because they're not going to be dealt any damage. And the smallest golems we're really going to have are 3-3s. Three now, yes, there are golems in here that are smaller than 3-3, three, three, but since most of our cards care about making golems and pumping up the golems, 3-3 three, three is kind of our baseline. It's not often that we're going to have less than that, but there's a good chance we'll have more power or more toughness, so we can really do some damage in combat. And then finally, this leads us to our last theme of the deck. Since we are making golems, we care about artifact creatures, it only makes sense that we care about those artifacts going to the graveyard. So that is where we get things like Marionette Master, which is four black black for a 1-3 human artificer, has Fabricate 3, so when it enters the battlefield, we can either make three servos or put three plus one plus one counters on the Marionette Master. Most of the time, we're probably going to choose the plus one plus one counters. And whenever an artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, target opponent loses life equal to Marionette Master's power. So if we have a 3-3 Golem die, then all of a sudden, that's an artifact that went to the graveyard. If Marionette Master put the counters on herself, she is a 4 power creature, so target opponent is going to lose 4 life. That's going to become incredibly relevant when we have a massive board of artifacts because our opponents are going to have two choices. They can either take a ton of damage in combat or possibly block and kill their own creatures or possibly even kill our creatures, which is going to make them take damage with things like Marionette Master. I think I said two choices, but I guess that's technically three. I never claim to be super great at math, but I think you get what I'm saying. So we have a ton of artifacts that are going to be doing a ton of damage, whether it's in combat or because they're possibly dying. And then if they die, we always have Ravos to get them back if we need them. So this deck is all about the synergies of artifacts and specifically artifact creatures in the Abzan colors. But it's more than just the themes. Obviously, we got to look at some cards that really bring this deck together. And I'm going to highlight three key cards for you. The first of those key cards is going to be Steel Overseer. So Steel Overseer, two mana for a 1-1 one, one artifact creature construct. I know, it's not a golem, kind of feels like cheating, but you can tap it to put a plus one, plus one counter on each artifact creature you control. That is an incredibly powerful ability because it doesn't have to be activated at sorcery speed, so we can either attack or block and then before the damage is dealt, pump up our team by plus one, plus one, or maybe we just do it at the end of an opponent's turn, so that way when we untap, our stuff is even bigger, and we can just kind of slowly spiral out of control because our opponents aren't going to be able to kill our creatures, and then even if they do manage to kill our creatures, we have plenty of ways to benefit from them going to the graveyard. So Steel Overseer just makes our opponent's choices that much more difficult. Our next key card, though is going to be a little bit different, and that is going to be Eerie Ultimatum. Since we have so many cards that are going to the graveyard, cards that care about going to the graveyard, it only makes sense that we have ways to get them back. And one of my personal favorite ways to do that, especially in these colors, is Eerie Ultimatum, which is white, white, black, 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 green, green for a sorcery, return any number of permanent cards with different names from your graveyard to the battlefield. The nice thing about playing Commander all of our non-land cards have different names. So we can bring back literally every permanent from our graveyard to the battlefield, with the exception of some basic lands that might overlap, and make sure that whatever we're doing, we now have a massive board of creatures, preferably artifact creatures, probably going to be able to put counters on them with Steel Overseer, might draw a card with low shield. There's going to be a ton of stuff happening when Eerie Ultimatum is cast and resolved. So... I'm a big fan of this card. I tend to put it in pretty much any Abzan deck that I build. So just like in any other deck, it's no surprise that it shows up in the key cards here. And then finally, our last key card is going to be Bronze Guardian. So Bronze Guardian, four and a white for a star five artifact creature golem. It's got double strike. It's got ward two. It gives other artifacts we control ward two, and it has power equal to the number of artifacts we control. So at the very minimum, this is a 5-mana 1-5 double strike ward 2 that gives other artifacts ward 2. That is super, super powerful considering almost all of our creatures and a lot of our permanents in general 
are going to be artifacts. So now, if someone wants to remove our Bronze Guardian, or someone wants to remove our Steel Overseer, or they want to remove any of our Golem tokens, they have to pay two additional mana to do that. Plus, since we have so many artifacts in this deck, it's not unlikely that Bronze Guardian hits the board as a 7-5, 8-5, 9-5, maybe even a 10-5. And at that point, it only takes a couple of turns for it to knock someone out of the game. Because it's very unlikely that people are going to be able to put anything in front of it that can stop it. And yeah, it doesn't have Trample, which isn't ideal. But there are ways in the deck to give it Trample if that's something we feel that we need. So those are our cool key cards. And the next thing we've got to do is talk about some cool interactions. And so I would like to highlight a pair of cards and then a second pair of cards that are going to synergize super well together and give us a bunch of value, if not necessarily winning us the game. So the first cool interaction we got to talk about are a pair of partner commanders that while they're not the partners of this deck, I did consider both of these in the beginning before deciding that I wanted all three colors. So Armix, Filigree Thrasher, and Rebecca, Architect of Ascension. So Armix is two and a black for a 3-2 legendary artifact creature golem. Whenever Armix, Filigree Thrasher attacks, you may discard a card. When you do, target creature defending player controls gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of artifacts you control plus the number of artifact cards in your graveyard. It is very likely that this ability just kills a creature every single time we attack, which is perfect. That's what we wanted to be doing. Unfortunately... Armix is only 3-2, so there is also a very good chance that something can just block and kill Armix when it attacks. That is where Rebecca comes in, because Rebecca is a 4-mana 3-4 that says artifacts you control have protection from each converted mana cost among artifacts you control. There is a very good chance we have most converted mana costs, or mana values, in play at any given time among our artifacts. And having protection from a converted mana cost, or a mana value, means that you can't be blocked by a creature with that mana value. So if Armix is our only artifact, it can't be blocked by creatures of 3 mana, because Rebecca is giving it protection from 3 mana artifacts. However, if we have a 1 mana, 2 mana, 3, maybe all the way up to like 5 or 6... We have protection from all of those mana values, meaning that nothing of that mana value could block Armix, making sure that it's always going to get through in combat, keep killing things, keep putting things in our graveyard to get back with um, any of our big spells with Ravos, with the Eerie Procession. All of these are going to be very relevant, and the two of these cards together are going to be very powerful. And this is a big reason why I considered both of them for Itch Techix partner, but like I said, I really wanted both colors, and I just couldn't bring myself to take Itch Techic out of the command zone because I really like his abilities, big fan of what he does. But that is only cool interaction number one, and if we move on to cool interaction number two, that is going to be between Eerie Interlude and Maul Splicer. Now, admittedly, I could have put any of the splicers in place of Maul Splicer, but I specifically chose Maul Splicer because it's six and a green for a 1-1 one, one human artificer, but when it enters the battlefield, you put two 3-3 three, three colorless golem artifact creature tokens onto the battlefield, and it gives golem creatures you control trample. This is the only splicer, as far as I'm aware, that puts two golems onto the battlefield instead of one. That becomes relevant when we pair it up with Eerie Interlude, because Eerie Interlude is two and a white for an instant that says exile any number of target creatures you control, return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So Eerie Interlude exiles all of our creatures, brings them back into play, and then we get to have the enter the battlefield abilities trigger again. So Maul Splicer is going to make us two more golems. Any of our other splicers are going to make us some more golems. We have a ton of things that might trigger on Enter the Battlefield, like Loshiel. So Eerie Interlude is going to give us all of those abilities again, but it's also incredibly relevant to note that Eerie Interlude brings the creatures back at the next end step. So if we have a massive board of golems and someone casts a board wipe, we can use Eerie Interlude to save our board and then bring them back at end step, making all the golems again and basically act like nothing happened while the rest of our opponents hopefully lose everything they have. So Eerie Interlude on its own is amazing in this deck because it's board wipe protection, 
But since we have so many creatures with enter the battlefield effects, it doubles up as being able to essentially double the size of our golem army at any given time. So eerie interlude, like I said, phenomenal on its own, even better with our splicers. But that brings us to the end portion of our deck tech where we got to talk about the price. And the price of this deck this week is $87.66. And I'm not going to lie to you, that price has been slowly creeping up since I built the deck. This is the most recent deck tech price, I suppose, is the best way to say it. But unfortunately, it is slowly going up, and it's mainly because of one card, and it is our most expensive card this week, and it is Mycosynth Golem. So Mycosynth Golem is 11 mana for a 4-5 Golem, has affinity for artifacts, and it gives other artifact creature spells we play affinity for artifacts. This is a massive $35.61. It was not this expensive when I put it in the deck, but since Brothers War has released, it has slowly been creeping up in price. So I do apologize if it pushes the price of this deck over $100 soon. Hopefully it doesn't, but I can't unfortunately control that. It is under the budget when I built it. Hopefully it stays under the budget for the foreseeable future. But the reason this is in here is because Mycosynth Golem giving affinity for artifacts to all of our artifact creatures is absolutely phenomenal. Most of our creatures are artifact creatures, so all that's really going to do for us is make all of our stuff cheaper and for some of them even free. Since we have a lot of golems that don't cost anything, we can now play them for free add to our affinity, maybe play, you know, one white mana, one green mana, whatever, for our creatures that are artifacts but still need colors, and make sure that whatever we're doing, we have the mana for. So that is why Mycosynth Golem is incredibly relevant, a very powerful card, slowly creeping up in price. However, if you do need to trim the budget, and I usually would say trim the budget a little bit. In this case, you're trimming the budget down to about $50, which is a much bigger price difference than a cut would normally cost for these decks. But you could replace Mycosynth Golem with plenty of other cards. And in fact, there are some very good golems that did not make the cut for this deck that you could swap it right in for. And speaking of cuts you could make to the deck, Let's talk a little bit about some out-of-budget upgrades, and I know this is kind of a, a weird thing to talk about considering we just mentioned a card that was $35, and the out-of-budget upgrades are actually not more than $35. So, in this case, I guess if you're looking for a cheap swap, you could actually take out Mycosynth Golem and maybe put in one of these. So our first one is actually only about $5, $4.96. That is Arcbound Reclaimer, and I would recommend swapping out Viridian Revel for this one. So Arcbound Reclaimer, 4 mana for a 0-0 zero, zero golem. You can remove a plus 1 plus 1 counter from Arcbound Reclaimer and put target artifact card from your graveyard on top of your library, and it has modular 2, so it enters with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters, meaning we can use its ability twice before it would die. Now, we do have other ways of putting counters on it. We've already looked at Steel Overseer. There are some other ways as well. So we could possibly get more out of this, and this essentially is another way to rebuy some of our creatures. If a golem dies, we can just get it back, put it on top of our library. The downside to this is that it's not technically drawing us a card, it's just putting the card that we want from our graveyard on top of our deck. So we might get into a situation where we're not really able to draw the cards that we want, but I think in the end it's worth it just to be able to get the cards that we think we need at any given time. And the card I would recommend taking out, Viridian Revel, is a card that I put in here to be card draw because it's one green green for an enchantment. Whenever an artifact is put into an opponent's graveyard from the battlefield, you may draw a card. My expectation was with the number of treasures running around with things like clues and uh, food tokens and any other just random artifact tokens that existed, that Viridian Revel would probably be okay. But after a little bit of playtesting, I think it's a lot less common than it feels. So I decided if you want to make a cut Viridian Revel, not quite as good as I expected it to be. I'm sure there are playgroups and situations where that is wrong. However, in my own experience, I did not feel that it was worth the slot when you could use something like Arcbound Reclaimer instead. But I do have one more out-of-budget upgrade, and this one you might already see coming because it's probably the most famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, golem in Magic, and that is going to be Blightsteel Colossus. So Blightsteel Colossus 
12 mana for an 11-11 golem, has trample, infect, and indestructible, and if it would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, reveal it and shuffle it into its owner's library instead. So this does several things for our deck. One, it's a massive 11-11, perfect for what we want. It's a golem, already on theme. It's got trample, it's got indestructible, does it all. It also has a little bit of infect, so maybe it just one-shot someone out of the game, but hey, you know, you can't win them all. And then it also, as weird as it sounds, kind of protects us from, like, milling out. We can't really mill out because we're never going to draw the last card in our deck with Blightsteel of Colossus. Someone puts it into our graveyard, it goes right back. So it's a little bit of insurance against maybe going a little too far with putting stuff in our graveyard. So that's at least something to consider. And the card that I would suggest taking out for it is Golem Foundry, which I have found is a very fun card, but again, not super powerful. So Golem Foundry is three mana for an artifact. Whenever you cast an artifact spell, you may put a charge counter on Golem Foundry, and you can remove three charge counters from Golem Foundry to put a 3-3 colorless Golem artifact creature token onto the battlefield. So Golem Foundry, it's good, but it's not phenomenal. What I really noticed with this deck is we're playing one, maybe two, if we're lucky, artifacts every single turn, which means that we're only making a golem every two or three turns, which isn't super great considering there's other things we could be doing. And while it does produce a fair amount of golems, if we can get rolling with something like Mycosynth Golem, if we don't have that, it really struggles to make any meaningful impact on the game. Whereas Blightsteel Colossus is kind of a must-remove threat, so I feel if you've got the money or you've got it just laying around and you don't have a deck for it, it would be a good inclusion. But that finally leads us to the actual end of our deck tech, and before we jump into the actual game, because we do got to see how this works in practice, I would like to take a quick second to shout out some ways that you can help support the channel and follow us if that's something you're interested in doing. So you can find us over on Twitter at 13POYNZ, Reddit, u slash POYNZ13, and you can send us an email, dungeonlearnersguide at gmail.com. Those are all great ways to reach out if you ever have any questions, if you ever want to suggest cards that you would like to see turned into videos just like this one, or you just want to chat, I'm happy to do all of those things. And I do try to post updates as much as I can on Twitter. I'll be honest, I kind of lose track of the days sometimes and forget, but I try. And then if you want to support the channel a little bit more directly, you can head on over to TCG Player, use our affiliate link, which is in the description of the video. Once you click on that, any cards you purchase, we get a little bit of a kickback from as a thank you for sending them your way. And then finally, the most direct way that you can support us is Patreon, patreon.com slash dungeonlearnersguide. Over there, you get access to things like the deck lists a week early, so you can get some feedback. You get the guarantee that any cards you suggest will be turned into videos for the channel. I can't make that guarantee for everybody. I will certainly try to get to your cards, but unless you're a patron, I can't quite guarantee it. You also get access to the unedited gameplay videos. You get access to a random card sent to you from me every single month as a thank you. The random card, of course, being one of our four random cards we built around that month. And then finally, you also get access to a Discord channel where we build a lot of these decks and we play the games. So if you've ever wanted to be in some of the games for the channel or you've wanted to help build some of the decks, that is a great way to do that. And, of course, I gotta shout out our four current patrons as a thank you. We have William Swiftfoot, we've got Doodle, we have Calvin Schmidt, and Eric Huey. So, to the four of you, thank you all so much for all of your support. And, I suppose I've done enough talking, so let's see who our opponents are gonna be for the game. Because, of course, we can talk about our abs artifacts as much as we want, but we gotta see how they actually work. So this week, we are joined by three opponents. We have Bilal playing Selvala, Heart of the Wilds. We have Mike playing Tasha, the Witch Queen. And we have Kao playing Freyalise, Lanowar's Fury. So Selvala is a deck that we have actually played on this channel before. If you are interested, you should go check it out. Very cool. But it is a combo potential commander. There are a ton of ways to make infinite green mana with Selvala and then do crazy things like drawing your entire deck or playing out your entire deck and playing all the creatures. So 
even before we look at the other two commanders, this is easily the commander I'm the most worried about, especially coming from Bilal, because he is very good at making infinite combos. He's a very skilled deck builder. And so that does worry me going into this. So I think he's the one to watch. Next up, we have Mike's Tasha the Witch Queen deck. And this is a deck that he actually built on his stream over on Twitch, which if you're interested in Mike's Twitch channel, I will make sure that that is in the description of the video. He does some amazing content. You should definitely go check him out. But he made Tasha over on his stream pretty much with cards he just had lying around. So he's calling it like Tasha's Demir Trade Binder. So all of the cards he had just sitting around, didn't really have a home for, and now they're all together in one big value pile. So I'm very interested to see how this deck goes. And then finally, we have Cow playing his Freilis deck, and this is, as per usual with Freilis decks, an elf deck. He wants to play as many elves as possible, make as much mana as possible, and just kind of steamroll the board by, you know, making 30 mana with 30 elves and then casting a crater hoof, I would assume, and just kind of stomping people over. So very cool decks this week. I'm very excited to see how they go, although I am very nervous about the two green decks. Uh, golems get very big, but it's difficult for them to push through a lot of little boys. So we'll see how it goes. I hope you all enjoy the game as much as I will, and I will talk to you all once it's done. At the start of the game, Bilal goes first, followed by Mike, Cow, and then myself. On Bilal's first turn, he plays a forest. Mike plays an island. Cow plays a forest. I play an Urza's Mine. Bilal plays a forest and then casts Sylvan Library, letting him draw three cards at the start of his turn, but forcing him to pay four life for each card he keeps beyond one. Mike plays an island and then casts Prophetic Prism, drawing a card. Cow plays a forest. I play a Tree of Tails. When Bilal draws for his turn, he draws two additional cards, keeping all three and paying eight life. He then plays a forest and casts his commander, Selvala, Heart of the Wilds, letting any player draw a card when they have a creature enter with the greatest power, and she also taps for a green mana equal to the greatest power among creatures Bilal controls. On Mike's turn, he exiles a black spell from his hand to evoke Grief, looking at Bilal's hand and making him discard a card, in this case, Steel Leaf Champion. Then Mike draws a card thanks to Selvala and sacrifices the Grief since it was evoked. Cow plays a forest and casts Courser of Crufix, letting him play with the top card of his library revealed, play lands from the top of his library, and gain a life when a land enters under his control. I play a Vault of Whispers and cast Golem Foundry, which gets a charge counter whenever I cast an artifact and lets me re remove three counters to create a 3-3 Golem token. When Bilal draws for turn, he keeps only one card this time, losing no life, plays a Forest and casts Garrick Primal Hunter, but Mike has an answer, putting it on top of his library with Memory Lapse. Unfortunately though, Mike is still missing his third land drop, so he simply draws and passes. Cow plays an Orin Reef the Vastwood from the top of his deck, gaining a life, and then attacks Bilal for two with his Courser. On my turn, I play a Swamp and cast Chief of the Foundry, giving my other artifact creatures plus one plus one and putting a charge counter on Golem Foundry. When Bilal draws for his turn, he keeps one card, losing no life, then plays a Forest and cast Beast Whisperer, letting him draw a card whenever he casts a creature spell. But Mike once again has an answer, countering it with a counter spell. Unfortunately though, Mike still misses his land drop on his turn and passes. Cal plays a Ghost Quarter, gaining a life, and then casts his commander Freilis Lanowar's Fury, activating her plus two ability, creating an Elf Druid token that can tap for a green mana. On my turn, I play a Dark Steel Citadel and cast my commander, Itch Tekic Salvage Splicer, letting me put a plus one plus one counter on him and all my golems whenever an artifact is destroyed, and also creating a 3 3 golem when he enters, drawing me a card thanks to Selvala. I then move to combat and attack Mike for two, letting him feel like he's part of the game. In Bilal's upkeep, Mike casts March of Swirling Mists, exiling a blue card from his hand to phase Selvala, Itch Tekic, and Chief of the Foundry out. Then Bilal draws for turn, not losing any life as he only keeps one card. 
Then Bilal plays a forest and casts a regal behemoth, becoming the monarch and letting his lands tap for two mana as long as he remains the monarch. Then he draws a card at the end of his turn, since he's the monarch. Mike again, unfortunately, just has to untap and pass. Cow plays a forest from his library, gaining a life, activates Freyalise's plus two ability, making another elf druid token, then casts Immaculate Magistrate, letting him activate it to put a number of plus one plus one counters onto target creature equal to the number of elves he controls. Finally, he casts Null Mage Advocate, which can be tapped to return two cards from an opponent's graveyard to their hand and destroy an artifact or enchantment. On my turn, I play a Plains and cast Mycosynth Golem, which puts a counter on Golem Foundry and gives all my other artifact creatures affinity for artifacts. This lets me cast Bronze Guardian, putting another counter on the Foundry, giving all my artifacts Ward 2, and having power equal to the number of artifacts I control, which is currently 8. I move to combat, attacking Bilal for 5 with Itch Tekic and a Golem. He blocks the golem, killing it and only taking 1 damage, but this does let me put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each techic and all my golems, and take the monarchy, drawing with it at the end of turn. When Bilal draws for turn, he again only keeps 1 card, losing no life. He then plays a forest, and casts Woodfall Primus, destroying Freyalise when it enters. Mike casts a Mox Diamond, discarding a land, and notably, the art on this Mox Diamond was drawn by Mike himself. He then casts Tasha's Hideous Laughter, making each opponent exile cards from the top of their library until they exile 20 mana value worth of cards, getting rid of quite a few. Cow plays a Forest, gaining a life, and casts Mind's Eye, letting him pay a mana when an opponent draws a card to also draw a card. At the end of turn, I remove three counters from Golem Foundry to make a 3-3 Golem token. Then, when I draw for my turn, Cow pays a mana to also draw a card. After that, I cast Mirror Retriever, putting a counter on Golem Foundry and letting me return an artifact from my graveyard to my hand when it dies. Then I cast Kodama's Reach, searching my library for two basic lands, putting one into play tapped and the other into my hand. I play a Plains, and then attack Cow for four and Bilal for 18. Bilal decides to block with his Primus, returning it to play with a minus one minus one counter when it dies, destroying the planes I just played. Cow also blocks with his Corsair of Crufix and before damage, activates Immaculate Magistrate to put three plus one plus one counters on the Corsair. This kills my Golem and I put a plus one plus one counter on each Tekic and all of my other Golems. Then I draw for Monarch at the end of turn. When Bilal draws for turn, he keeps one, loses no life, while Cow pays two mana to draw two cards. Then Bilal casts Garrick Primal Hunter, immediately activating his minus three ability, killing the Planeswalker to draw five cards, since he has a creature with five power. Once that's resolved, he plays a forest and casts Rishkar's Expertise, drawing five cards because he has a creature with five power, and then casting a spell, mana value five or less from his hand for free, which ends up being Eternal Witness. Then when the Witness enters, he's able to return Rishkar's Expertise from his graveyard to his hand. When Mike draws for turn, Cow pays one to also draw a card, then Mike plays a Blast Zone and casts Intellect Devourer, making each opponent exile a card from their hand and allowing him to play them. This exiles a Forest, Overwhelming Stampede, and Viridian Revel. Cow plays a Forest, gaining a life, and casts Emerald Medallion, making all his green spells cost one less, followed up by casting Mana Gorger Hydra, which gets a plus one plus one counter whenever a player casts a spell, and finally cast Priest of Titania, which can tap for a green mana for each elf on the battlefield. On my turn, I cast a Forsaken Monument, making all my colorless lands tap for two, my colorless creatures get plus two plus two, and letting me gain two life when I cast a colorless spell. This also triggers the Golem Foundry, getting another counter, then cast Phyrexian Triniform, which creates three 3-3 three, three golems when it dies, and also gains me two life, putting another counter on the Foundry. I move to combat, attacking Cow for 22, but unfortunately, he activates the Null Mage, returning a counter spell and land to Mike's hand from his graveyard, destroying the Bronze Guardian, paying the two for ward. This does trigger Itch Tekic, though, putting a counter on himself and all my other golems, then I draw for Monarch at the end of turn. When Bilal draws for his turn, he keeps all three, paying eight life, while Cow pays two mana to draw two more cards. Then Bilal casts Nissa, who shakes the world, letting his forest tap for two mana. He activates Nissa's plus one ability, untapping a forest, putting three plus one plus one counters on it, and making it an elemental creature with vigilance. 
After that, he casts Nature's Chosen on Selvala, allowing him to untap her for free once a turn, which he immediately does, casting Kozilek Butcher of Truth, drawing four cards on cast but not drawing one from Selvala since my Triniform is still bigger. After that, he cast Instill Energy on his commander, letting him untap Selvala for free once a turn. This lets him untap Selvala to make 13 mana and cast Rishkar's Expertise, drawing 12 cards and playing Sword of the Perunes from his hand for free. He attempts to equip it to Selvala, which would give him infinite green mana, but Cow thankfully has a response, casting Nature's Claim to destroy the sword but gain Bilal 4 life. This also triggers Ichtekic, putting a counter on himself and all my golems. Bilal then casts Soul's Majesty, drawing 12 cards since he has a creature with 12 power, and taps Selvala for 12 more mana to cast Hyrax Tower Scout, untapping Selvala again. Then he casts a Shia Soul of the Wild, making all his non-token creatures into forests, meaning a Shia is a 15-15 since her power and toughness are equal to the number of forests he has. This means Bilal finally gets to draw a card while Selvala, or at least it would if Cow didn't activate his Immaculate Magistrate to make his Mana Gorger Hydra a 15-15 in response. Bilal once again taps Selvala, this time for 14 mana, to cast an Elvish Mystic, followed by a Wayward Swordtooth, letting him play an extra land for the turn, playing a Forest, and also casting Prowling Serpapard, making all his creatures uncounterable. Then he casts a Regal Force, drawing 11 cards since he controls 11 creatures. He then casts Revitalize, untapping all of his creatures, and after that, he's finally able to cast Umbral Mantle, and since none of us have a response, he equips it to Selvala, letting him pay 3 mana to untap her and give her plus 2 plus 2, generating infinite mana. Then he's able to sink all that mana into an infinitely large Walking Ballista, using it to do an infinite amount of damage to each opponent, winning Bilal the game. All right, so that was a sweet game, a very cool showing by our deck. I am genuinely very proud of how it performed, even though we didn't quite end up winning. It was super cool to be attacking with massive golems and seeing some of the synergies with its tech kick, so very, very happy with how it turned out. And like I said, unfortunately, we didn't quite get there, but I felt like we could have maybe if we'd had things like trample or some ways to get rid of blockers, but not unfortunately in the cards this time. Um... If we go counterclockwise around the table from where I sat, Cow also did very well. His deck was definitely becoming a threat, and he actually mentioned when the game was over that if he had been allowed to untap with the Priest of Titania, he would have been able to actually win the game. He would have generated enough mana to knock the rest of us out. So very cool to see him get that close, and unfortunately didn't quite get there, but still a very cool showing nonetheless. Mike... Really had a rough game on this one, being stuck on two mana for the vast majority of the game meant that he didn't get to do too much. He did still play a relevant role by countering some early things, especially from Bilal's board, because Bilal probably could have comboed off a lot sooner if it weren't for Mike, so definitely thankful for that. Got to play a little bit more of the game. And then, of course, we got to talk about the winner. Bilal's Selvala deck did what, well, any Selvala deck really wants to do, which is just kind of go off, make a ton of mana, and it's not surprising to see it win with infinite mana into an infinite walking ballista, but it was still very cool to see him kind of piece it together because I believe the turn before he won, he drew about 10 cards, and then the turn that he did win, he drew close to 40 cards. So it was really cool to see a mono green deck draw that many cards using almost entirely creatures, and then those creatures' powers and toughnesses, I think that's how you say it. Is it toughnesses? I don't know. To be able to draw a ton of cards and then use those to win the game. So very, very cool from Selvala. I've never seen Selvala do bad things, so very impressive. But Hopefully you all enjoyed the game, hopefully you enjoyed the deck tech. If you did, please do like the video, subscribe to the channel, I would really appreciate it, as we are especially getting closer to 500 subscribers, which is absolutely wild to me, but thank you all so much for watching, thank you all for listening to me ramble a little bit there at the end. If you have any suggestions for future cards, put them in the comments below, I would love to hear them, but otherwise, I will see you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.